Call the Land Use and Information Committee meeting for September 7, 2021, to order. Notice has been posted in accordance with Wisconsin Statute 19.84 Open Meeting Law. This time we'll take general public comments. If you have comments that are on the agenda later on, we'll go into them after when we we'll open the public hearing. General comments that I have so far. Our Tony DiNardo. He has a phone or? No. Are you Schultz? No. I, that was just a test. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you failed. <laughs> David Klopp. Present. Please come up and state your name. What is that? My name is Nia. Okay, thank you. Yeah, th thank, thank you for uh, letting me come up and speak to you today. Um, I'm from uh, Luck, Wisconsin. Um, got a long history in Polk County. Uh, many, many family members in the graveyard down there. Uh, been good stewards of our water, our, you know, and we've got good water. I can drink it right out of my back woods, right out of the ground. I pass all my nitrate tests, all pollution, and I want to maintain that standard of my water. My water is really magical. It's got lithium in it. And uh, a lot of people don't know about that, but it's it's very soft, drinkable water. Um, Lithia Springs in Georgia, the Indians went for 
hundreds of miles to go to the springs to drink this magical water. They knew something was there. And, uh, and you have that also up here in Burnett County. Um, you've got some amazing glacial history. Uh, glacial Lake Brandsburg receded. It got blocked by the sublobe of the Des Moines Glacier. Made a vast glacial lake from here all the way to St. Cloud. And this mountain of ice melted and that water flowed down the St. Croix. And it left a beautiful sand outwash plain up here. You only have one aquifer. You screw that up, you're not going to get another chance at another one. Because there isn't another one. So, you know, I came up here today. This is important to me. I really value my water. And uh, a lot of people don't. And I do. And, uh, but I think you're going to find more people do. Um, but this is a bad deal with the Chinese, this Smithfield. They came in. This is a shell game, this Cumberland, this Sawyer guy, it's a big shell game. It goes to the Chinese Communist Party. That's who you're dealing with, the Chinese Communist Party. And they want to come over here and pollute our water. And I just hope, hope, hope to voice my strong objection to you people to preserve it. And uh, that's why I came up here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great clap. That was my brother that just spoke. <laughs> but we've been in uh, we've been in Polk County now, I think. Oh gosh, a couple hundred years now, our family goes back. And we drink water, we bucket it out of a uh, spring in our backyard. That's the water we use in our house. What a magical place, but you, you're, it's not going to last, and uh, I don't know, reiterate what he said as well. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Hanson. I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Land Use and Information Committee. Um, we have later on the agenda today the item of delivery of the campground work group report to this committee. I don't believe there's a public hearing on that topic, so I chose to speak during public comment. I'm speaking today on behalf not just of myself, but of Preserve Burnett County, which represents thousands of residents and property owners from all across the county. I personally have a cabin at 11465 North Shore Drive in Grantsburg. We've been following the work of the campground work group very closely, and we've been attending those meetings, uh, those Friday meetings that happened over the course of the summer, and paid very close attention to the recommendations as they came out. We have some very specific suggestions. We want to make sure that those are considered as you draft the actual changes to Chapter 30 that we anticipate will be presented next month for public comment. And so those, the, the areas that we still see some concerns are we do not want to have campgrounds conditionally permitted in any residential areas, including RR3 zoning. We would prefer not to have campgrounds conditionally permitted in agricultural areas, like including A2 zoning. Um, I think you're removing it, or it's already been removed from other agricultural areas, but we're concerned about a 25 unit campground in agricultural areas. And we believe strongly that temporary camping should in fact be temporary, that those units should be removed for four months of the year, or at a minimum, that water and electricity should be turned off. Now, um, in terms of the process here, it was a little unclear just exactly what the committee would be doing today, but we understand that you're receiving the report and approving receipt of that report, not actually approving the substance of it in terms of changes to be made. So we hope that you will still consider this input and public feedback on those points. Um, the members of the work group have received, since really last Thursday, since we firmed up what the agenda was for today, um, have received about 250 or more letters from residents and property owners in Burnett County with comments to these effects. And so most of those letters went to uh, Supervisor Conroy, but some went to also to Supervisor Awe and to Supervisor Payton. So I hope that you'll have a chance to look at those. I've read just about all those letters. 
um, a, a little bit of, about them. Um, we, because of the short time frame here, we did make it possible for folks to share their letters with each other so that instead of uh, everyone having to write something from scratch, some folks chose to, to build off of what others said or use that same language in their own letters to hopefully give you a sense of just how much consistency there is in support of the changes that I'm talking about here. So I hope you have a chance to, to look at all those letters and do hope that by next month you're coming to the table with uh, recommended changes to Chapter 30 that we can all support. Thank you for your time and your service, and take care. Thank you, Patrick. Don Hamilton. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? I'm on the phone. Go ahead, Don. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Don Hamilton. I live at 7158 South Devil's Lake Drive. I'd like to give a big thanks to the entire land use committee for their service to the people of Burnett County. Uh, in my opinion, your commitment to making sound land decisions that comply with chapter 30 and the comprehensive land use plans of the county to include the village plans and the towns is no noteworthy and appreciated. I'd also like to give a big thank you out to the three members of the campground work group subcommittee. Um, in my eyes, I believe they've done a superb job of listening and learning from just about everybody in Burnett County with respect to the challenges seasonal campgrounds and the instant communities, three to 500 people create for our infrastructure and including the fire, rescue, emergency and law enforcement services that are paid for and provided by the taxpayers of Burnett County. The subcommittee's willingness and I really appreciate that, their willingness to hear from everybody, the taxpayers, educators, professional leaders, the villages and the towns is not only positive, it's a great example of why the county's comprehensive plan intended to share the responsibility for discretionary land use decisions um, made by the county um, to be part of the people living in the affected town or the village. I, I think the plan is a really good plan. And the hard work that subcommittee performed the past couple of months demonstrated the high value and merit your committee places on constructive <laughs> feedback. And that's important because it leads to more communication. And, and I believe it's just this type of communication that will improve and help all of us to better understand each other's perspective. And ultimately, all this communication just simply improves the relationship between the taxpayers, the villages, the towns, and your committee who makes the decisions. And I, I think we can all agree that's a good thing. So today, I look forward to the cooperative land use planning efforts of the entire committee continuing. Thank you for your service. And I look forward to hearing about the recommended changes to Chapter 30 with respect to campgrounds. And thank you in advance for recognizing how important this issue is for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Next, I have a gentleman that has signed up, but he didn't indicate Fred, Fred Painter what he wanted to talk about, which, what agenda item he wanted to talk about. Uh, the egg zone. Egg zone? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Clarify Next, we'll have approval of the agenda order. Make a motion to approve the agenda order. Motion by Mr. Patton. Second. The I was on the list also, did you? It's on a list to speak. Can I speak? I believe you're signed up to speak when the public hearing comes up about the actual A text amendments, right? You signed no, up. I'm, to... I'm, for the, uh, I'm against this talk. Yeah, so you're signed up to speak when item TXT2102 comes up at the public hearing, right? Those other people signed up to speak under just general comments at the beginning of the meeting where they can talk about anything they want. So I, I signed up to speak to the campground. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be coming up on the agenda. No, that was no. not. No, the campground is not an own police. The general comments that were just made. Did you sign up on the sign up sheet? Yeah, right here. Uh, it's a problem. Oh, you can't you got to tell us. If... I wanted to make my comment on this too. I called in. So I got to wait now or what? <clears throat> so if you want to speak about the egg stuff, you will speak about it when it's on the agenda. What's the egg stuff? 
The TXT2102. signed up at the door, so I don't have that list. <clears throat> That's why we appreciate people signing up ahead of time, so we're not having two lists of people signing up at the door, signing up online, because now we got to try to coordinate lists. So Is your name Jerry? Okay, I think he's in Right now, general public comments. Jerry Crook. State your name. Jerry Krause, I live on Lake Minerva uh, in rural Danbury. Uh, thank you again for your tireless work on updating the rules concerning campgrounds in the county. I sent comments to Mr. Conroy uh, over the weekend. He responded back. Thank you very much. There are a couple of points that I raised in my letter to Mr. Conroy. I want to make sure uh, that uh, the committee is also aware um, that uh, one of the recommendations is that the newly proposed dimensional requirement will that meet the tenant for minimum would be then uh, perhaps become conforming uses. Uh, this is a suggestion perhaps of some kind of automatic rezoning, which I would think was inappropriate, uh, but rather uh, those campgrounds that were granted through CUP uh, be required to uh, follow the rezoning process, allowing for input from effective property owners, the town, as well as the county. Um, in certain areas, certainly the rezoning of RRRC may be appropriate. On the other hand, very inappropriate given the location and other uses nearby. A couple of things I also mentioned in my letter to Mr. Conroy is uh, I know the work group had talked about uh, screening requirements and setback requirements as well as density. I would hope that you would uh, very seriously consider uh, significant setback and uh, screen requirements uh, for any kind of new campground under the RRRC uh, protocol, as well as anything that might be uh, converted over, that they also comply with those kinds of things. You just have to travel to places like on the north side of Devil's Lake to see the absence of screening um, in that location for a public roadway. Density is also, I think, very important. I'm not sure the density of the new campgrounds that were approved over the last several years, uh, but I think it should be dialed back from that level. Uh, what you have now is a look and purpose of an RV, a mobile home park, not an official campground. I made an inquiry of one of the newer campgrounds. In fact, you cannot rent a, set, a site for the season to pitch your tent. You have to actually have some kind of structure that's hooked up to the utility system. Even at something at five per acre uh, is with decks and storage buildings, fire rings, trailer, watercraft, uh, other park recreational and personal travel vehicles. It's a very congested area, which tends to spill it onto uh, public right-of-ways as well as other adjacent landowners. I attended the town of Oakland meeting last month, the Newport Campground. Uh, individuals there were trespassing on private property, managed to set a fire. Um, in a forest nearby another property owner. So there are serious concerns, I think, when you add density to a confined area. So thank you so very much um, and uh, appreciate your continued uh, assistance in this regard. Thanks again. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> now we'll go on to approve the agenda order. We had a motion by Mr. Anderson, second by Mr. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Approval of the minutes from the August 3rd, 2021 meeting. Motion to approve the minutes. Motion by Mr. Lombard. Second by Mr. Anderson. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Now we'll get into public hearing. Will Jason please read the public hearing notices? Notice of public hearing, State of Wisconsin County, Burnett, Tuesday, September 7, 20, 
2021 at 9 a.m. at the Burnett County Governance Center, room 165, Town of Mina, Wisconsin, regarding the following. Conditional use permit CUP 2121, Bloomers and Halen. Public notice here, to all persons in the Town of Daniels, Burnett County, Wisconsin, that Deidre of Bloomers and Greg Halen has made application for a conditional use permit for the terms of the Burnett County Land Use and Shore and Protection Code Ordinances. To construct a duplex on a residential parcel located on Dunham Lake at 9493 Dunham Lake Drive in the RR1 Zoning District, parcel located in Government Lots 5 and 6, Section 21, Town 38, North Range 17 West. Conditional use permit CUP 2122 Cook. Public notice here we're given to all persons in the Town of Swiss, Burnett County, Wisconsin, that Paul and Katie Cook have made an application for a conditional use permit for the terms of the Burnett County Land Use Code of Ordinances. To operate a home occupation business consisting of breeding, raising dogs, and guiding hunts off the property at 8682 Black Bear Trail in the RR3 Zoning District, Lot 10, Black Bear Acres Platte, Section 36, Town 41, North Range 17 West. The next amendment, TXT 2102, Burnett County Ordinance Chapter 30, changes to various agricultural districts. Public notice here by giving to all persons in Burnett County, Wisconsin, the land use and information committee is proposing to amend the Burnett County Code of Ordinances, Chapter 30, changes related to from the large scale livestock ad hoc committee. Thank you. First of the public hearing is conditional use permit CUP 21-21, Coolers and Halen. And Greg Halen on the phone. Or come up and state your application. Like <laughs> um, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to, um, we came before you approximately three years ago to get a permit for our campers on the property, uh, which you approved. We, um, you had a stipulation for us to add well and septic, which we did. Um, we would like to, my sister and I, we have we each have our own families, and we would, as much as we love each other, we'd like our own space. And the thought of, we just thought of building a duplex would be, uh, be a great way for us to uh, unify our families, but at the same time have our own space. So, um, been coming to Donham Lake for 43 years. My parents had a place there. My grandparents had a place there. So it's a big part of our life, and we're ready to uh, move forward with construction. Um, if uh, if you feel it's, uh, it's something, so thank you all. We appreciate it. And uh, so, yeah. thank you, Greg. Thank you, Mark. Here, uh, Mark is he might be virtual. Are you on the phone, Mark? I am listening in. You wish to make any statements about your application? I do not have any further comments. Okay, thank you. Are there any? Have we received anything from the town at all? Uh, we have no correspondence, nothing from the town. Okay. I will open up the public hearing at this time. Is there any? Anybody wish to make comments on this application? 21 21. Hearing no comments, I will close the public hearing on 21 21. Committee have any questions or comments that they wish to make to the applicants? Uh, I have a question. Supervisor Conroy, I have a question that posing to Jason. I didn't. Uh, remember, run the calculation on the impervious surface for this. Does this meet spec, or would this require additional mitigation because of this proportion of the structure compared to the area of the lot? Well, if if it needed it, we would calculate all that prior to issuing the permit. We would have to have all the impervious surface figured out. Um, I haven't calculated it yet at this point. It looks like it may need additional. It'll be close. I mean, they're going to be 75 feet. Right. And they have 150 feet of frontage. Kind of pies down, though. So. Right. I, I'm not. I mean, I understand the request, but I don't think it's really unreasonable. I just wanted to question that a little bit. It, it wouldn't be a reason not to do it. It just may require 
additional management of the runoff because the total size of the structure is a little bigger than typical. But yes. Within that, in fact, it has 150 feet. It's slightly troubling, but, but yeah, that's why we do the conditional use permit. In this context, with a family owning it, I'm not troubled by it at all. But if there were two totally separate parties, it would be like a mini condo at a density higher than the normal density for a single family dwelling on a waterfront lot. That's yeah. out there, but it's not enough to make me want to oppose it. So. Any other comments or, comments or questions from the committee? A lot would have to be split under your, you know, what you were suggesting, would it not? So, very... Pardon? I... It, wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to be split, but the supervisor comment as a, uh, a duplex, it's a town hall, whatever you want to call it. It could potentially have two entirely unrelated parties owning half, but the lot would be held in common undivided interest, it could not be split into two lots. And so it would be remain regulated as a single family lot, or I should say a single ownership lot, a single 30 foot access corridor, both docks, those sort of things. So within that context, I, I think it would be okay. Yeah, they don't have enough area to make two parcels. And it would be just like Craig says, just yep. so you, like a single family. Yep. Lot. Correct. Mr. Otto. I move to approve conditional use permit 2121. Motion by Mr. Otto to approve the conditional use permit 2121. Second. I'll second that. Any conditions on the conditions? It, it was just the ones that uh, are specified by. Plan use permit to be up to prior to building and follow on local county and state regulations. Those are the two conditions on the motion. Have a roll call vote. Mr. Pearson? Yeah. Mr. Patton? Yes. Mr. Bobber? Yes. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Ron? Yes. Mr. Conroy? Yes. Mr. Bickford? Yes. Conditional use permits. 2121 has been approved. You'll be notified by the Land Use Committee. Thank you. Next. <clears throat> and we have two more sign ups at the door. I wish to find out what they wish to talk about. One is Steve Christians. See if you signed up there. Do you would do you plan to speak at all? No, I I'm just going through that. I thought you had to be in the meeting. Okay, fine. So nothing. Um, Doug and Wendy Holdstrom. Same thing. You don't plan to speak? <laughs> Next we'll move on to conditional use permit twenty one dash twenty two cook. Home occupation for breeding, raising dogs, and guiding hunts. Is Mr. Cook in the audience or on the, on the phone? Are you on the phone? Yes, this is Katie Cook. Okay, go ahead and explain your, your application. Good morning, Chairman and members and staff. Uh, my name again is Katie Cook. My husband Paul and I live at 8682 Black Bear Trail. Um, near Danbury, and we are submitting this application to start a home business breeding, um, breeding English setter upland hunting bird dogs, and then guiding occasional hunts in the fall. Um, the application says off our property. Uh, we wouldn't be doing anything at the property. We'd be meeting hunters um, at the hunting locations. So the address is all that's on the property. Thank you. Have we heard anything from the town? Uh, we have no correspondence, nothing from the town of Swiss. Does the committee have any questions or for the applicant on their application? Mm -hmm. 
Do you have any public comments? Speaking for public hearing? I will I, I will ask after you do hope you have any comments or questions you want to ask the applicant. The only one that I, I have is that Supervisor Conroy of maybe how many dogs do you are you gonna have as breeding stock? Uh, understand you're going when you have a litter of puppies that's they're gonna be finding home belts. But how many are you planning to have? Yes, the limit now I think is 15. Right now we've got eight dogs and uh, a couple of breeding dogs. So we need the limit to be high enough to accommodate those litters. We don't plan on keeping um, more than eight to 10 dogs at a time, um, but the litters would up our limit. So we need to have a large limit for um, numbers to accommodate those litters that happen. And we'd be having probably a max of two litters a year, so maybe 10 puppies in each litter. So 25 to 30 dog max is what we'd be looking at. You know, uh, the supervisor counter, I'm not sure that in the, that the, pup, the unweaned pups count against the number as long as you're moving them out. You know, um, it's not like a maintaining a, a sled dog pack uh, type of thing. But, uh, you know, I, again, um, I, I I think that that uh, as a number, anticipate two litters a year to be sold, and and you cap of a number you would give us, like eight dogs that were going to be permanently there. Uh, uh, no, the, the the current limit is fifteen, so we wouldn't need any. Um, conditional limit on dogs if we had less than 15 anyway. So um, I guess we'd like more than the 15 limit that's currently imposed by the um, townships. Yeah, okay. Is it a 15 the kennel license or is that a? Correct. Yeah. Well, we have in our ordinance that we've limited to 15 um, as one of the- uh, we, don't, and I, we don't have, I'm, I'm a little on, unprepared on this one because I didn't look into that, but the, uh, the 15 number, does that presume puppies and all, would you say? Well, we don't have that specified in our ordinance. We don't have it specified. I agree we have to use it that way. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. So that, that number, then if she's talking eight dogs plus potential litters, maybe you said up to about 20 then, total counting puppies? 25 to 30. 25 to 30. Okay. That's the number I was asking for. Okay. Let's say 30. Any other questions for the applicant? Mr. Um, but that's including pups. I'm wondering if we if we can put a condition on it if we want to uh, condition the number of adult dogs, breeding dogs. That, that was what I was getting at. I thought that might be provided in language. And I didn't look up, but it does not. So I think that would be reasonable. If we're not talking 30 adult dogs here. If a litter was going to average eight and you had two litters at a time, you'd have 16 puppies plus your eight dogs, it puts you at about 24, you know. So I, I guess I'd ask like Katie to give us a number of adult dogs that they would have when they don't have puppies for a potential cap on that. Did you question you're asking? Yeah, that, I'm asking, asking the applicant for how many, but discounting puppies, how many adult dogs did you expect to have, you know, routinely? You hear the question, Katie? Yep, yep, I heard the question. Well, I guess uh, 16, since 15 is the current cap, 20 would be the number that I'd like to see on the conditional use permit if we need to have a cap. More than 15, because 15, we don't need to get a conditional use permit. Are you understanding that we're, we're differentiating between pups and adults? Yes, definitely, yep. But that language isn't specified anywhere, so I don't know right. so we if it makes a difference. Our, when we moved in there, I don't know, just for some context, when we moved in there 
20 years ago, our next door neighbor had about 30 to 40 bear dogs chained up on the trees in the lot next to us. So I don't know. I don't think our request for 20 to 30 in a temporary basis would be anything out of line with what's currently going on in the county, licensed and unlicensed. I, I agree. I think what we might want to do, though, is limit. We could have a, uh, an ultimate limit for the number of living dogs, pups and adults, but then also put a cap on the number of adults. Let's, let's put the limit of the uh, pups and adults at 30 and then the limit of adults at 20. Works for me if we pick that number. Hmm. Any other questions with the applicant? No, we we have two letters of pups at the same time. The reason we're concerned is that if we happen to have two coincident litters, which isn't common but can definitely happen, we could have up to 20 puppies on our property plus nine adult dogs, 10 adult dogs, 15 adult dogs. So we just want to make sure that we're operating legally under our use permit. Um, And so I guess I would ask that the limit of all dogs be capped at 30 total rather than trying to differentiate between adults, puppies, and getting into confusion about enforcing that. I, I think typically where we run into problems or where the community runs into problems is having a whole, uh, a large number of adult dogs out there barking. Yeah, like, and, and like I said, that's what we encountered when we moved in there. Um, and, and we currently have a large number of dogs under the 15 dog cap, but there's still, um, not going to be a lot more noise with 20 puppies on the property, but we just want to make sure we're legal. And you didn't get any public comments from any of our neighbors about the conditions now. So I don't know that there's been a, a problem. Yeah, we're, I think we're trying to help you out and get the conditional get the conditions so that they support what you're trying to do. Good deal. Um, you know, it, that's where I would be willing to go even higher as far as the max number of uh, dogs, okay. animals, but limit the number of adults. Okay? Okay. Assuming essentially that you're, I don't want to call it a puppy mill, but you're... No, no, absolutely not. We're the opposite of a puppy mill. No. Um, we've done some hobby breeding in the past, um, and, and have had interest in puppies from all over the country. Um, so we're not, we're not a puppy mill. We raise puppies for our own hunting use, and when we have extras, we place them into homes. So we're certainly not raising – we raise um, a specific bloodline of English setters that are well-respected throughout the country. We're not a puppy mill. We're not going to have 40 dogs on the property, but if you want to put 40 as the cap, that would be great. Then we know we're legal. Um, or I guess if you want to separate, is this is there a precedence for separating separating all puppy puppies versus adult dogs? Are there other cows operating under conditional use permit that have um, caps that we can consider, or can we just say we're going to have 20 adult dogs and and then puppies throughout the year? I think based on the way the wording of the ordinance, we have to put some kind of it doesn't differentiate between pups and adults, so we have to put a limit on it. Uh, how many breeding dogs do you have? And how many, so I think two. We have two breeding dogs right now. Breeding and then the rest are hunters? Correct, yep. Okay, do, do you plan on having more breeders? Yes. Okay. So you might have, you know, if how many breeders are you thinking of? How far are you going with that? I mean, it could be as many as 10 to 15 down the road. Readers? Yeah. Okay. That's where I'm trying to help you out here because if we put that 30 max, your breeders are useless because you can't have the pups. Okay. So, uh, I, you know, well, you'll have to come. How far out do you have a plan? I mean, I guess this is our kind of our life's plan. <laughs> this has been something we've been working toward for a long time. So um, it's hard to project how many quality breeding dogs we're going to be able to develop in our program to reach the state status of becoming a breeding animal. So it's really hard to say um, long term how many dogs we might have at a time. 
Um, that's why I threw out that 10 to 15 number because potentially in 10 or 20 years, we could be at that point where we've developed enough of our own dogs that we've got a bigger breeding program. Okay. We're trying to co- cover potentialities that may or may not come to fruition, yeah, so but we want to be legal. Update your conditional use permit to get more as your plans change. So we want to make sure you're covered now. I'm thinking, uh, Supervisor Conroy, uh, again, I, I understand what they're trying to do, and I understand entirely that this is not the same thing as having 20 bear dogs chained on, on how <laughs> uh, Because you're going to have helping areas, and you're going to be inside with the puppies. You're going to keep, you're going to be too valuable to just let run the luck. You know? Exactly. We've got a pretty nice kennel facility that we built just last year. It's on our property. Um, it's, it's the, the dogs that we breed currently are part of the family. So we're on the property with, with them all the time, working with them. I haven't said all that, though. I, I do understand where Supervisor Oz is coming from. And so maybe for now, let's say 20 adult dogs and, and nominally 35 pups, but that number is soft because if you have lucky enough to have three litters of 10, you might have more, but you might have three litters of four and not, and not, you know, right. I know how that works. So, so if you're okay with 20 and 35 pup, total of 35, including pups, and that could be up to a year old on the pups, um, I'd be fine with that if you're fine with that for now. Yep. Yep. That to, sounds great. If you want to increase it in the future, um, come back and see us. Okay. I'll open the public hearing this time. Are there any public comments on this CUP 21-22? Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. Does someone wish to make a motion to include conditions? Oh, yeah, a question. If we were to just have 20 of the limit for adult dogs, would that be in conflict with the, the Burnett County number of 15? What's the, what's the situation on that? No, that, that's why they have to come and get a conditional use permit is if you want to have more than 15. Okay, so that's not a problem then. Correct. Okay, very good. Thank you. <clears throat> With that, I'll resolve all move. We approve the conditional use permit, uh, setting a condition on 20 adult dogs and a soft cap of a total of 35, including puppies, recognizing that could be a little dynamic up and down. And their puppies are defined to up to one year old. I'll, I'll state. Pardon? I'll, I'll state. Right. And then, you know, I uh, was about to add to that the uh, staff recommendation that uh, we follow all state, county, and federal requirements for this activity. I'd like to second the motion. I have a motion by Mr. Conroy, second by Mr. Blomberg. We'll have a roll call vote. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Adam? Yes. Mr. Blomberg? Yeah. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Ron? Yes. Mr. Conroy? Yes. Mr. Bickford, yes. Conditional use permit 21-22 has been approved. Thank you, board. I'm in committee. Next, we have text amendment 21-02, chapter 30 changes related to items from the large-scale livestock study ad hoc committee. So you have... Uh, and it's been posted online, uh, the, the changes we made after last month's meeting. I don't know if anybody wants to go over, we want to go through all 90 pages one by one again, like that we did last time. That was so fun. Um, uh, I think that we shouldn't need to do that again. Uh, I would... Uh, I, I would say uh, maybe that before we start the public hearing, 
I'd like, I actually would like a, a, a show of hands of the people who now are aware that under the current rules, all 160,000 acres of Burnett County are open to cable. Everybody understand that? Okay. Um, what I'd like to point out about this whole amendment package is that this will re this will remove 80% of that 160,000 acres from the potential to have paint blocks. It will cap livestock animal units at 500. And that includes quite a bit of trade weight that is zone A2. The state law pins us down into saying that if you limit animal units in ag districts, you shall have one agricultural district that does not have limits on animal units. So if you can tell me a way to get around that, I'd be happy to listen. But there is, our advice is there isn't. Um, you all read the ordinances adopted by Bayfield Ashland of this county. We've read them too. They're targeting CAFOs only with the entire county board. That's a separate ordinance from what we're doing where we're trying to regulate in the agricultural district. So with that, um, carry on. Jason, do you have anything further? No. Do the committee members have anything further? If not, I'll open the public hearing at this time. It's not a hearing. What? Yeah, it is. Public hearing. Public hearing in text 2102. And the ones I have listed, uh, Fred Painter, Frederick Painter. Thank you. Good morning. Excuse me, welcome to another day in paradise. And uh, listening to these folks who consider this paradise, and I'm sure you do too. And I spoke to about 75 to 100 people last weekend who also think about this as paradise and an environmental paradise, cultural paradise, beautiful area to live in. Okay, these people happen to be lakeshore owners on Wood Lake, Trade Lake, Round Lake, and Spirit Lake. And frankly, they were all quite horrified to think that. We would consider putting this facility within two miles upwind, I might add, of these properties. They ask, who's doing the break even analysis here? Who is deciding that what we have now as a tax base, as a tourism base, restaurants, bars, and whatnot, the construction industry down there, which is not flourishing simply because people are putting everything on hold until we figure out exactly what's happening. So the entire group was ready to revolt in mass, to be perfectly honest with you, and they asked if I would come and say, let's don't have a sacrifice zone. Okay, I know that's novel, but can't we just call the state and say, look, we don't have a sacrifice. We're unable to figure it out here. So let the chips fall where they may. The corporate gods will be very unhappy with that, I don't doubt, and maybe, maybe there'll be ramifications from that. But who comes out smelling like the rose? You guys, because you perfected, you perfected your group of people. And that's very important to these people. And they are paying most of the taxes in trade lane. So what happens to that tax base if they all just split? And lots of them said, that's what we'll do. We'll just move out, leave the mortgage, leave the property, and call it good. So somebody needs to do this break-even analysis and decide whether or not we shouldn't just walk away. Let the chips fall where they may. Great Lake is not going to go down as a sacrifice very easily. And so, thank you. Next, we have Judith Claren. Good 
morning, and thank you very much for listening and for what you've done for us so far. Um, you over the years, and I've, I've read a lot of these documents, and a lot of you are still here. We know you've served for decades, and we appreciate that. You've written countless documents over the years, and we seem to always speak about quality of life, environmental integrity, watershed protection, financial responsibility, recreation, tax dollars, revenue, farmland preservation, and responsible use. And I assume that you're considering these values when you're discussing the zoning for Trade Lake. Now, Craig, I listened to you, and you said, well, you know, if we do this, we protect the rest of the county. But how do you discriminate against the people who have spent their life savings in some cases, or their entire life? We bought a lot on Little Trade Lake back in the 90s. We planted orchard trees. We try to be good stewards of the water. I have raked invasive weeds out by hand for 25 years. 25 years trying to protect our environment, protect our water, and be good stewards. You need to consider the very values that are your core values when deciding on this vote. You can't throw one township or one village under the table bus. No county droves. And it won't just impact trade lake. It impacts all the surrounding. We have a single aquifer. You heard, you heard that. I studied that. I researched this. I've heard it a million times, and I thought, I'm going to make sure this is true. It's true. We also have shallow groundwater. You guys did a land and water resource management study in April of 2019 that we found that, that we are highly susceptible in Burnett County to contamination of our groundwater because of the shallow depth. These are studies I got on your website. I also have a letter here. This is from uh, Jeff Lade and Roger Heinrichs, who are previous board members in Trade Lake, and it went to Nathan uh, Ehall e uh, at the time that was a Burnett County Administrator, dated June 18, 2019. It says, as you know, there's a proposed site. Now, these guys were on our board at the time, okay, so they were board members. As you know, there's a proposed site for a large concentrated animal feeding operation capo to be built in the town of Trade Lake due to the overwhelming opposition to this proposition by the residents of town, the town of Trade Lake. Supervisors Jeff Lade and Roger Hendricks would like to inform you, the Burnett County Board of the following. Chairman Jim Willing has recused himself from any discussion or decision regarding capo ops. There is much concern as to what such an operation in our area will cost for the ecosystem and human health, more specifically, water and air quality, and the negative impact this operation would cause. We feel more time to research. It's three minutes. Okay. In closing, I just want to say we got to look further than a sacrificial man. Craig, let's go Jackson, where you live. Thank you very much. Like that, he's back at the door. Next is Marsha. Oh, Opera? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was born and raised in uh, Trade Lake Township. In fact, my family has lived and worked in Trade Lake for over 100 years. So we do have a lot of commitment to the community, and we have a lot of skin into this Trade Lake Township. But Trade Lake is actually more than just a home. It is also a real estate investment for us and part of our 401k. So I want the board to tell me, today if possible, what percentage of real estate taxes are paid to trade lake by people like me. I own a home, I own land, but I'm not actively farming. And what is the percentage of active farms that are paying uh, real estate taxes? And then what are the capos paying? And it seems to me that if People like me who pay a significant, a significant amount of real estate taxes. Um, or, you know, taxes that are close to like 
We deserve to have a place at the table to determine to determine what trade lady is now today and what it's going to be. Alan Peterson. Thank you. Uh, I had a speech all prepared, and on the way up here, I decided not to do it. Uh, not the speech, anyway. I uh, got a lot of my information out of this book. I think some of you had time to read it. Uh, it's called Cable, and it's got all the things that I wrote my speech on. If anybody want to, in this committee wants to borrow it, I'd be willing to that. It's got everything. So, Sacrifice zones. Sacrifice zones are usually done in remote areas or near poverty housing, populated by people that have no political accounts to draw upon, refineries, chemical plants, and polluting industries with influential ties to law. I lived in a sacrifice zone about 45 years ago, and I did the wrong thing. I stayed. And all of my friends that I worked with in a very small, uh, not very profitable cafe left because there was a developer who wanted to put high rises where we were. They offered me uh, a place to live if I stayed. Uh, small house that was really nice with a couple of bedrooms. My friends all moved away to another neighborhood. And we continued that they continued to work at this small cafe. I got a job at the railroad laying steel and it paid a lot more than a little of this and a pitcher of beer. And uh, I was comfortable when I sold them out. I soon found my farm and trade lake from a friend and moved up here. And uh, when I moved, they tore the house down that I was living. The neighborhood has been completely transformed with high rises public housing of various kinds, and uh, that was the wrong decision for them to make. And it was very hard to uh, realize that I had sold out my friends and stayed for a bribe. We'll put you in a really nice house. It'll be okay. You'll be fine. Just don't protest this, okay? And uh, I made the wrong decision. Very ashamed of that, but that's who I am. So please uh, don't make people move or take bribes, which has been offered already, and uh, give that a reconsideration, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Outside Milwaukee, my whole life, uh, I put myself here on Trey Lake in '98 to get away from Milwaukee. In Milwaukee, all I've seen was progress. I lived on a farm too when I was three years old. Now it's all houses, condos, no farms, pollution, everything's bad. You're going to allow that to happen here? I'll move. I will not pay any more taxes. I will leave. I do not think it's fair that these people here on Trade Lake are considered sacrificial cows, because that's what you're doing to us. I would really appreciate it if this committee really considered what they're going to do with this. And I hope that you can do something with it, because I worked my whole life to get where I'm at. And I also have another house back in town that I should have left a number of years ago because of the way things progressed there. I will not put up with it here. And there's a lot of other people here that probably will not either. Why are we sacrificing Trade Lake? Trade Lake is a beautiful area. Where I live, it's a sanctuary. There's all kinds of wildlife and I love it. I can drink out of my spring and it's quiet and there's no noise and there's no pollution. Please do not take that away from us. Thank you. 
Annie Johnson. That was a pass. Tim Murphy. <laughs> Hello, good morning. My name is Tim Murphy. My family owns property on Lakewood Drive on Big Trade Lake, Wisconsin. First, I want to thank the board for the opportunity to address you this morning in regards to the life changing issue that's before us right now. In 1975, my uncle purchased property on Conrad Z and Lakewood Drive. For three years, I hunted and fished and enjoyed the outdoors with my family. In 1978, my parents bought our lakefront property on Lakewood Drive. When we first moved there, the lake was murky, filled with bullhead carp and dogfish. Water clarity was about one foot and milfoil foil and invasive plants that choked out the shoreline, making it impossible to even swim in. Fast forward to 2021. Last week, I walked out on my dock and I could see the bottom of the lake at six feet deep. Carp and bullheads are few and far between. Invasive plants are losing their battle. Bass, sunfish, crappies, northern and musky all flourish, and we're catching good walleye. Softshell turtles, painted turtles, hognose, snapping turtles flourish. Why? Water quality has increased. Landowners on and around our lakes are working hard to create and sustain this beautiful ecosystem. The RTLIA Ron Trade Lake Improvement Association is working tirelessly to continue to improve our waters and surrounding systems. We get to enjoy wildlife that flourish in our areas, including Fish Lake Wildlife Area, the County Oak Flowage System, and the St. Croix River System, and more. Last week, my grandchildren, our fourth generation to Trade Lake, got to see a loon swimming right next to our pontoon as it would dive down and come up with a fish in its bill. We saw a bald eagle dive down and grab a fish, and osprey soared right over us, all within 15 minutes. Several times I've seen mink running the shoreline. Gray fox, red fox abound, and deer and bear are everywhere. I love this area. It is my little piece of heaven. I am here April through November, four to five days a week. Now let's fast forward to 2031. The capital that you allow in is at full operation. Giant pits of liquid manure sit blowing in the breeze with their high concentration of ammonia gas. The air stinks of acidic pig manure. Dead pigs lay rotting and bloating, waiting to be buried. Trade River no longer hosts its river suckers due to the acidity levels. Trade Lake system is clogged with invasive plants due to toxic levels of phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, magnesium, sulfur, manganese, chlorine, boron, and molybdenum. Say that three times fast. The fish are no longer safe to eat and have reduced numbers due to the heavy metal runoff. The water is no longer safe to swim in. Did you know what takes pig manure? A minimum of 70 days to mature and compost, while cow manure only takes 36 days? Hypothetically, you say, it's not. I have friends in Northwest Iowa, 20 miles from Sioux Falls. They have two castles with pigs within a mile of their house. Thank you. This doesn't work. It's not gonna work, folks. I have fourth generation, please. Thank you. And I wanna thank you all for at least facing me. I've been to meetings where people are on their phones, people are looking away, they're doing other things. Thank and I've watched you, you all paid very good attention to everybody speaking, so thank you for that. Very cool. Yeah, you kind of land challenges. Uh, thanks, guys, for all the work you've been doing on this. Um, yeah, I know we're not going to sacrifice zone the whole county. Just anybody that's an ag is now considered a sacrifice. So I have a few points I want to make regarding the amendments you've made to the issues. Ag one, uh, there's no mention of carpets to disposal use on the large facilities. These huge composting companies where they come with big carcasses. Not stop seven days a week, and it exhausts out the smell of it takes for 10 miles. So we need to address that in this amendment thing. And also, you put in a 100 foot setback for feedlots and facilities. Um, per farms require a 1,000 foot setback. These smell a heck of a lot worse than a fur farm. Could you please increase the setback? And on Ag 2, this is where we really get nailed. Uh, bag two is 10 acre parcels. 
and you put down that a conditional use permit is not required up until 250 animal units. And again, 250 animal units is 2,500 pigs, 2,500 sheep. And that's 250 sheep per acre, 250 pigs per acre. You think of the size of your house lot. Your typical house lot is just about an acre. And ask yourself if you want 250 pigs or 250 sheep swirling around you, because that's what this will do. And with no conditional use permit at that amount, that means unregulated waste disposal, no water testing, no air quality control. So what I'm asking is, and I, it's going to sound radical, but it's really not, make the conditional use permit 25 animal units per egg two. That's residential, rural residential parcel, 10 acre parcel. 25 animal units would still be 250 sheep, 250 pigs, you know, 40 cows, something like that. And if they want more, then they have to come to the board and get a conditional use permit and be held accountable. That would maintain the quality of life for our community. We need accountability. Right now, these facilities, it all takes is having a couple of these facilities in Polk County. And within a 100 mile radius, they look for these small parcels to place their feeder facilities on. So they, they intentionally look for where they don't have to have, that they're allowed to go to 2,500 without a conditional use permit. And they're placing 2,499 pigs on these small parcels all over the countryside. And our county will be saturated in pigs unregulated. So I know we've been focusing on the big facilities, the mothership. But these, it's all these communities within a 100 mile radius of one of these facilities that's really dangerous. So please tighten up the conditional use permit requirements on the small acreage parcel. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Johnson. Morning. I'm going to add a new perspective. Hopefully, if you're sure you're tired of hearing all the same old stories. I also refuse to uh, I, I refuse to hold people's perspective in a negative way. I appreciate everybody's perspective, and this will not divide my neighbors and me, and I've lived in this area forever. Thank you for the chance to add perspective to your decisions. My name is Steve Johnson. I live in the town of Anderson, and I'm currently a member of the Planning Commission. I also previously served as the town chair. So I know what's going on in the town, and this issue was too big for a town. The purpose of my three minutes is to give you the is to give voice to the town of Anderson. As you know, the town of Anderson consists of 1.5 townships and is located directly west and downhill of the proposed capo, and you also know the saying what runs downhill. According to the hydrogeologist Andrew S. Leeson, the groundwater and the surface water from the town of Trade Lake runs directly to our town. When I reviewed the county comprehensive plan, page 31 shows a map for groundwater contamination susceptibility. It lists the proposed CAPO site as the most susceptible in our county. The most susceptible. The nutrient management plan lining the Wood River and the Trade River with spreading areas as they flow into our wetlands, including myriad acres of state waters and federal waters that we are supposed to protect as a town and as a county. The Town of Anderson Comprehensive Plan is very clear about the onus placed on us to protect our natural resources, yet we have no say, the Town of Anderson has no say what happens in the Town of Trade Lake. We are dependent on the decisions of other people, like you guys. We do try to protect our citizens, just like you guys try to protect all the towns. In 1982, there were no internet regulations because there was no really internet. And as the technology advanced, it was necessary to produce all kinds of rules and regulations. In 1982, when the Right to Farm Bill was written, the possibility of a 26,000 hog capo in Burnett County was not on the horizon. It caught us all by surprise and we're peddling. 
It did include one important caveat. It says, the right to farm does not cover anything that could potentially be dangerous to health and safety. So they covered their case right there. It does not cover anything that could potentially be dangerous to people's health. It's supposed to cover the nuisance issues. I'm not here saying that I have the panacea for this complex issue. It caught everybody by surprise and it forces new regulations. I am here to say somebody should listen to the town of Anderson if we're in this together. I spent a lot of my life coming up to meetings, township meetings, county meetings. I attended every one of the large livestock committee meetings, except for the one where they went on a tour and the one where I could get my computer tour. The Large Livestock Committee is a lot of what you're basing your decision on. I look at that committee maybe differently than you do. At the first meeting, Nate said, we're having an open meeting and we encourage everybody to ask questions. I asked questions the first two meetings. After that, we were no longer allowed to ask questions. We were told, put them in writing. I'll ask them. We put them in writing, we handed them to me, and we handed them to Dorothy Richard. Questions never got asked. So it looks to me like we only have part of the equation to make a decision. If you have bad information or incomplete information, you make bad decisions. And I understand how hard Craig has worked on. And you as a committee are put in a very hard situation. You're saying that we have to have something, but the law doesn't cover the situation. And we as citizens, we only get three minutes to speak. The Large Livestock Committee, near as my calculations, had somewhere between 25 and 32 hours to make their case. We haven't had a chance to make our case. We only get a couple minutes, and then the buzzer goes off, and then we're sent out the door. You know, I've got stacks of information from the Centers for Disease Control, from the Environmental Commission. I've got water studies. I've got guys who used to do manure management plans, and they say, what a joke they are. When I tried to ask that question at the Large Livestock Committee, I got the dirtiest look I've gotten since I was in high school. Nate looked at me like I was some kind of alien. I don't know what we do as a county, but we cannot give up our environment, our wonderful lakes, to sacrifice the people like the, the people at uh, Cumberland LLC. If you look at their application and you look at what they put in there, it's lots. Jeff Sauer's a liar. He lied on when he signed it. There's applications there where they have spreading ground. They never ask the people, can we spread on your land? You know, let's do this right. Let's take the time. Let's take another committee and have the people that live in the area that pay 59% of the taxes in trade life be able to save their sex. Uh, there's no correspondence from the town. Um, you've gotten lots of emails, which you've all been forwarded. And I don't know if there's anybody else that signed up in person this week. No, I wanted to check on that. Okay. Just ask again, Norm. Make sure there's nobody still that. Anybody hey, else have been signed up? My name is Tony Denardo. Okay, you were on first, Tony. You didn't answer. Go ahead. Oh, I was having issues with my internet, so my apologies. Uh, 
Go ahead. Same with public. Okay. Good morning. My name is Tony Donardo. We have purchased property on Little Trade Lake and have had issues with the developer. We met with Ava Developments last July, put money into escrow, and closed in October. At closing, we met with the excavator, got the perk test done as we were starting to build. We were planning on to start building immediately. The developer texted us to let us know that the road was not completed and cannot be driven on. Tom was clearing the land on his own, and he refused to hire an excavator. We were closing on our home November 19th, planning on living in our RV until the build was completed. We begged the developer to hire an excavator as he had, as we had no place, no other place to live. We couldn't build until the road was completed, and it wasn't until he hit a clay pothole and needed to hire an excavator, which was not until mid-November. He fi finally hired Taylor Excavating, and our build did not start until February 25th. So February 25th came, we started building, and as we all know, the um, road restrictions had moved, been moved up a week early, and we needed our well guy to come in and get put our well in. Well, the road, the driveway that we have, it's, it's, about, it's approximately 800 feet long. Um, to get into the driveway, it needed to be 33 feet wide, and we went to the developer to ask the developer if he would, if, if he could correct us. He said, well, it's your property now. You've got to deal with it. Not knowing anything about the city ordinance, we're just focusing on building our home, just getting everything done, because still today, currently, we are living in our RV. Um, our home started getting built. Um, we have been reaching out to the developer to correct the road. Um, it's not, um, you know, I, I guess I'm looking for some clarification as to, you know, is the road, when you go to clear it, it says 20 feet, it's got to be cleared 20 feet. What does that mean? Is it, you know, cleared where it's um, where it's a road at 20 feet or is it cleared 20 feet tree to tree? And what does that really mean? Because it's kind of vague in the or within the ordinance. And then as far as, you know, what's the developer's responsibility in the, in the ordinance, it says that he needed to have um, within 60 days of the land use permit, he needed to have this road done, completed. You know, back in 2018, he went to you guys to ask for, you know, he wanted to build this development on Little Trade Lake. Um, from my understanding, there were a lot of back and forth and some, a lot of people did not want this development here. Um, we've purchased two lots and we uh, are, have tried so hard to work with the developer. It's not a safe road. We've had grants for um, Corey from the fire department. He's come out. Because I, I just, I, I, we've called, you know, land services. Jason and Tia know me very well, um, just by phone, and um, just wanting to kind of. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Jerry Krauss. I signed up when I came in earlier. Good night. Is it in regard to the yeah, the case, Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Krause, sold it at Dan Murray, uh, Lake Minerva, have a in the last hour. Uh, I mentioned uh, last month when I was here, I grew up on a small dairy farm in southern Minnesota, Los Angeles County, which uh, those small farms are still there, but they've been displaced. The dairy herd and small hog operation uh, now is the site of large CAFO operations. The drive that goes from the western side of the county to the small town of Los Angeles where I was born uh, is just a gauntlet of stench uh, that makes you want to vomit as you drive through it. Having grown up on the farm, I'm very familiar with what manure smells like, and this is manure on steroids. Uh, it is just plain nauseating. And I sounds like the committee uh, work group went on a tour. I would hope that you would go to places like Westico County if you haven't been there to see uh, and experience what exactly you're talking about. And I heard this reference to the Trade Lake being a sacrificial zone. Uh, it's just not going to be Trade Lake, as you know. You've heard from uh, the Tom Anderson as well. And uh, the air is the air that's going to blow around uh, among us in the groundwater that you've already heard about. And 
I don't think it's appropriate to sort of thrust uh, onto the southern end of this county uh, what you're contemplating uh, in doing here. We've heard lots of comments over time about the concerns of what's going to happen to the county. And I would really urge you uh, to not rush forward. Take your time, take more time. This may be the most monumental kind of thing uh, that uh, you will do, perhaps, in the time that you've done on this board. I know that Mr. Conroy and others have worked diligently to deal with the campground, sort of an internal threat, if you may, uh, to the county. Uh, where our own neighbors uh, and acquaintances have put in campgrounds. This is an external threat, at least at the present time, and it's a serious threat. If you think campgrounds was a serious threat, this one has got to be probably 10 times, maybe a hundredfold dangerous uh, an impact on quality of life, on values. Uh, I would really urge you to not rush forward. You can table what you have. You can make other decisions. Consider what Batesville has done, which also apparently is Douglas as well as Ashland County, rather than try to sacrifice and cut off, if you may, a good chunk of what is a very beautiful environment here in our county. Thank you so much for your time and listening. Yes, sir. Uh, you have Jeff Clarence's name on the list there to speak. Yeah. I did it by online. Yeah. I won't take that much time. I've done pretty much. Just going to reiterate what everyone else. State your name, please. Oh, Jeff Clarence. Uh, I live on Little Trade. And Sacrifice Zone. Unlimited Livestock and Trade Lake. Just the name of the whole Sacrifice Zone. You already know that's not going to be a good thing, especially for Trade Lake. And like they've said, it's not just going to affect Trade Lake, it'll affect other districts. Um, the easy thing to do would be to vote yes. I'm asking you to vote no and come up with a different solutions. Being an elected official of Burnett County, you should try to protect and serve all of the county, not just 20 of the 21 districts. Thank you. I would appreciate this person with the sign if you wouldn't be putting it up on. Oh, please. Is there anyone else? If not, I'll close the public hearing. Go ahead. My name is Amy Joy, and I just moved to Thompson in June. I'd like to tell you that was in the writing. That gave my whole family PTSD to move to a very quaint and beautiful countryside. And there's a battle anywhere you go. I understand that. But I would fight to not be in a sacrifice zone as I have babies that are not going to be sacrificed for this cause. I appreciate local farmers and I support wherever I can. I have a small business myself back in the cabin. Um, and just would like to humbly put that towards you that I love my children and I love my neighbors and I would like them to be heard that we matter too. Thank you. What was the public hearing at this time? Anybody wish to make any comments? <clears throat> Supervisor Conway, I've got to cover a couple of things that uh, perhaps weren't noticed in reading through the ordinance. Uh, one, Mary Fox talked about setbacks. Uh, we do put it, we have uh, attempted put it in both in the siting ordinance, which is also under amendment, and this land use ordinance. 
boulder offset standard that's developed by the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, the state of Minnesota, and the state of Iowa, believe it or not, um, which Wisconsin declined to do back three years ago when NR 151 was in for review and the egg industry people objected to it. That was based on size of the operation, increase in setbacks, and of course they ran like frightened deer when they did that and did not proceed with the mandatory state required amendments to NR 151. We're going rogue and are going to attempt to put it in there. Um, also keep in mind that what we've been doing today is as if we did a conditional use permit on the Sauer LLC, Cumberland LLC project. They have never applied for one yet. We will at some point be doing that individual permit. This is not that. This, and, and the worst term ever coined by an attorney is sacrifice. They're not sacrificing trade rights any more than they're sacrificing Dewey, which also has a substantial amount of exclusive egg zoning, more than trade lake. Dewey is not here in uproar because no one's applied for a FAFO there. But we have a very large dairy farm in Roosevelt that's one heifer short of a CAFO right now. We have four cubs dairy farm in unzoned Wood River, which we're not regulating because of that, which is a CAFO. So we're all talking about a swine CAFO, but that's another matter. Uh, as we all know, Cumberland LLC's project has been denied temporarily by DNR based on soil conditions, which we all knew were going to be problematic. And uh, they, have, they have not even proceeded in the land spreading sites. Also remember that DNR is proceeding with targeted nitrate standards, which is because it is being a protective action limit substance on drinking water is in play for public health. We've we have referenced that in this ordinance too. We are trying to bulk up our conditional use permit capability above what the current ordinance is. And since they have not yet applied for it, if we pass this this much, when they do, this will all be in play. Right now it is not. So we are not as well armed as we would be if we get a kick at the cat down the road, if they ever get to the point of applying. Understand that. Also understand that much of the things you are upset about are attributed to the states being held captive by the industrial agriculture lobby. The state laws that constrict us as creatures of the state, as a county, we do not have the home rule authority of even a town. We have to, we're compelled almost to, to stick with the state law and not go rogue. Just understand that. So with that said, I'll call for the question. I have a comment. As a, as a new committee member, I'm looking at this ordinance, and I can tell you, I mean, with your testimony here, and some of the statements Craig has made about the DNR, this is a good enough ordinance that in all probability, I'd vote against this thing if it comes to us, but it isn't here yet. And without this ordinance, like Craig said, we would be up without any tools. But if you come up here with you know, groundwater issues and nitrate issues and all the things you're mentioning, I mean, we'd be hard for us to pass this. So our, our, effort isn't, our effort isn't to allow these people to come. Our effort is to be able to turn them back when they do come. And so we just need approval of the tools to do it. And I think uh, so far the committees have done a pretty good job in providing those tools for us. I think they want to come I, I really see what you guys have done, and I really appreciate it. You've done a lot of work. My biggest concern is the, the amount of li the livestock they're allowed to have before they get a conditional use permit from an ag two zoning. It's a, you're going to end up with eggs all over the place. If they put a mother facility in Polk County, they'll be here to the feeder facility because they go 2,499 pigs and they don't have to have a conditional use permit. I'm just asking that you modify the conditional use permit 
and bring the members' weight down, so they have to come and set our accountability. That's all I'm at. Can I, can I address that, Mary? That's Supervisor Conroy again. We did talk about that. We talked about it in LSLS as well. Um, that's the number we have now. That's the number we've always had. And we didn't change it lower. The siting ordinance, though, still applies all the way down to two animal units. Okay? So the, and that, that's a separate public hearing in the separate county committee. Siting is in natural resources. This is zoning. And we kept that number of 250 as being palatable because it is what we have had. And I got to correct you minorly, it's two and a half pigs equals one animal unit. That's for a sow. But a feeder pig under 55 pounds is well, I understand, but I mean, when you're, si you're talking about that and, and they, they grow up, but um, there are different numbers there, are varying, varying numbers. Okay. Right. All and if we could just bring in more accountability on that level, because there, there, is none. there would be in the siting order. You know, I don't know if, you know, if it's going to be popular to drop it that low for conditional use permits in zoning. Okay. What you're going with right now is that, as you know, an ordinance can be amended if we think there's an issue. But for now, 250 is what we agreed upon at LSLS, and that's what we forwarded to this committee. So. Right, can I ask you a question? So you're talking about ordinances, and you're talking about zoning. Why can't you put ordinances to protect us in place without changing the zoning for one? Because you're opening up the You really are. Just my opinion, personal opinion. All the legal advice we got because we're losing court. We and I disagree with the last two Supreme Court cases have won, and they're going for clean air and a clean water and, what state? and environmental. Here in Wisconsin, the last two, I'll send you the link. Okay. I think I did send it to you, Dave yeah. Ferris, and St. Ramona. No one, no one has shown me that that, uh, that we can achieve what the state law says we can do. That's, that's and most point. most boards will do this. They'll say we can't. The state says this, and they don't. They don't. They don't go up against them. But that's what we need to do. All right, maybe we do. But at this point, we're talking about moving amendments forward to get us further than we are right now. You know, again, we do that with the living documents. You but can we do that with the ordinances without changing the zoning? You really can't do that to the people of Trade Lake. You can't. We're not one district. We're 21 districts. And we're how many villages and townships? You can't. It's discriminatory to, to select out one, but because they're, they're poor, we're, they have less economy. We're so not. We're not distinguishing by township. We're distinguishing by zoning district. Exclusive ag exists in a lot more district townships than in just trade lake. So what we're trying to regulate is, is what we can regulate. You know, you read trade lake comprehensive plan. It's all about agriculture, and it did not. I admit, 10 years ago, nobody thought this would happen, but they welcomed all agriculture of any size. Nobody thought they were going to get this kind of thing. So the town of Trade Lake could step up and change its conference plan. They could seek to rezone all of its exclusive ag to A2. If you want to do that, town of Trade Lake can do that. I wouldn't oppose it. You know, but maybe we should be encouraging partnerships between the townships because they feel a bit like you. They feel powerless as a township because they don't have a lot of tax revenue base to spend. They, they're being threatened with lawsuits. They're, you would agree to the game with Kate Bullock playing behind well, the scenes that you guys aren't seeing. It's mm -hmm. dirty. One problem is, is that once you make an application in, under the state siting law, it never goes away. The one in Bayfield County is still valid and alive, even though they've never pursued it. There's a whole lot wrong with this at the state level that removes local control. And as you well know, the state legislature is all about local control until locals try to control something, in which case they pass a law to remove it, right? So when it comes down to health and safety. It's the ballot box. You need to start working on people that represent you. That's all I have to say about it. I agree with that. We do. Any more questions or comments? Mr. Blomberg, so the, uh, the points and concerns that Mary Falk brought up can and will be addressed when we look at the fighting portion. Is that correct? They're already in that, but they're not the same as in the zoning ordinance. But if someone were to try to have a facility 
uh, they would be regulated under the siting ordinance from, as you know, two animal units up. We incrementally increase that. That's the management of the facility itself. When we're talking about a zoning is where we can have how many animal units and when we require a conditional use. And that, that was the number we chose. That, that's what I've got for now. I don't see any point trying to amend this on the fly. I think it's in our interest to adopt what we've recommended and then continue to look at this issue. It's a dynamic issue. It's not going away. And if, and if it can, other amendments can be offered if we need to to address issues. I think we've gone about as far as we can with this. Oh, I appreciate what Mary had to say. And I, would, uh, I don't disagree, but much yeah. of this, I, or any of it, really, but my job is to represent what is different committees have done, what we're proceeding with, to get our recommendations, which were fairly progressive when we did them in LS, and we've added some things that have come up since then, targeted nitrate standards, odor offset issues. Those were not discussed in LS and LS because they didn't really exist at that point. They do now. And we didn't integrate that too with some discussion of on the side with former members. What do you guys think about this? Yeah, we think it's a good What you did, Craig, was very similar to the trade like ordinance. And I appreciate that. Well, I think uh, let's go on. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from any of the committee members? Mr. Rob, what are we what is what are we going to do today about this? Uh, what's our action? When we get around to making a motion, which I will make pretty soon, is I will move that we move these amendments to the county board for adoption. The ordinance, section 30 ordinance pertaining to agriculture. Can you do this without an environmental impact statement? I'm sorry. The DNR said you have to ask them for that EIS. And for certain triggers, and one of them is you guys do a groundwater study, which I believe I talked to Dave Ferris, it sounds like it hasn't been done. The EIS hasn't been done. Those are, those are all things that but they're not in this package. They can come. We have to budget to do that. You know, conduct a groundwater study. That can come through the Natural Resource Committee. Like, all we're talking we're about today. change the zone before we know that information. All we're bringing our time back up. I'm done. All we're talking about is these amendments that we propose and moving them forward. We're not amending the amendments. We're not holding more public hearings. In my opinion, it's time to move them along. But are you making these trade rates and limited tag? Is that what you're voting on today? We're talking about the package of amendments that are in this packet have been bounced around here now for about three months. Same, pretty much same LS, LS committee recommendations. We're, we're not actually changing any zoning in any town. No, no, we're not. Okay, okay. just want a clarification of that. Thank you. I had a little trouble hearing you. I'm sorry about that. But um, yeah, we're, we're not. We're, we're, we, have, we have a layered some additional restrictions on agriculture. And we, but we're not rezoning anything. There will no doubt be rezoning as a result of this. I should have said this before. Um, people may want to re move to rezone from A2 to A if they're a large dairy farm that now we have capped at fewer animal units than they have. That, that could happen in Roosevelt. Okay. That would be appropriate. He's already 999 animal units. Um, he's not conforming at 500, right? He's a, a known good operator, probably wants to expand at some point. That person should be able to do that. But people who are in zone A and want to get out of it, and certain places in the county where we have isolated, you know, a few acres of A that is inappropriate, we want to see that rezone to A4 or A2 eliminate any chance of a cable going there in the middle of a bunch of inappropriate rezoned property also. In other words, this is a big picture sort of thing. That's a, a living document. Keep, keep that in mind as well. But no, we're not changing any zoning anywhere. And the word sacrifice zone 
has never appeared in anything the county intended. That was a lawyer return recommended use in the discussion with the LSLS committee, and I wish we could have gotten rid of it. I objected to it then, frankly, that it's an inappropriate term to use for what we're talking about. But the lawyers like that, so there you are. Any other questions from the committee? Craig, would you like to make a motion? I sure would. Uh, I would like to move the, the recommended amendment that we have held to public hearing on the county board for consideration and adoption. Second. Motion by Mr. Tyner, I second by Mr. Pearson. A roll call vote. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mr. Patton? Yes. Mr. Lumber? Yeah. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Ah. Uh, yes. Mr. Conroy? Yes. Mr. Bickford? Yes. The next amendment, TX21-2, has been suggested to the county board for approval. Thank you. Next on the agenda, I want to take a five-minute break. I'd be good with that. Yeah. Back at M2. Good job. No, thank you.
Yeah, last night, in fact, I went, I got Peter, not Peter's opinion, I got um, in Virgin Field, I went down there, I, I went down there, or I went to bed, I figured, you know, and then, and then go right to bed, and then go right to bed, and then go I don't know if it helped. It might have been. But that's true. I don't know. Oh, yeah. No. 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 And we will move on to item number seven. Committee acceptance and approval of the final campground report recommendations and discuss the next steps. Oh, any meeting session? Not everyone got to read the. That yeah, was in the. It was in the event. Well, that can be the next step because it's in the public hearing anyway. No. No, it's not it's public. Where's this? Where's this guy? Yes, the board. Oh. It will take it to the next step to develop further language specifically. Yes. It didn't include everything. Not everything. <laughs> <laughs> what I like is that they had the cool there three months of the year. Well, that, that becomes a, an issue for who's going to enforce it. It would be nice if Wanda would send out a note when there are changes to the packet. I haven't read I downloaded it like Friday or something. Right? Yeah. Well, was, it was there yesterday. There was, there was a... I downloaded it on there Thursday. There was a boo-boo, for lack of a better word, about getting it... Um, on the, on the agenda. agenda, so we had to amend the agenda. Well, that, that's fine. It's just would have been nice if Wanda, once she changes the packet, to send out a note saying, "Hey, the packet has changed" or something. You want to lead up on this, or um, sure, you can call us back in the order. I reconvened at the time too. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're in order. Okay. Warren um, has handed me the mic to talk about that. Uh, Campground work group recommendations. So, uh, yeah, you know, we had intended this to be uh, on the agenda for this meeting, and it got on a little bit late, which unfortunately triggered my receipt of about 220 emails over the weekend regarding this. Uh, generally supportive, but uh, arguing that we didn't go far enough in some ways, concern about the potential for a 25 unit campground in RR3, um, some lack of understanding that the A2 provisions were intended to be only in conjunction with or accessory to other permitted or conditionally permitted activities in there in A2. Uh, so we, we, uh, we have those comments all in, in the rec on the record now. I left Jason with a flurry of emails yesterday afternoon to get them in our official custody. But uh, I guess the thing to do is to, I don't necessarily need to read the report, but I'll run through our recommendations. Um, Where do you start? Because I can't pull it up anymore. Did you go to the most advanced uh, recent uh, packet? Yeah, it's on there, but when I tap on it, it goes to text 2102. Oh, okay. Page 125, I think, is where the uh, stuff starts in the packet. I read it, so I did open it before. Yeah, I found it by accident by flipping your own last night. Yeah, table of contents. Oh, it's you right here. Oh, got it on there. I won't get you. 
the recommendations we can discuss them further if anybody has questions. But as you know, uh, and it's in, included in this report, we met every Friday other than the 2nd of July from the 23rd of April until the 6th of August. And we had a lot of different uh, interested parties in trying to keep it a, a reasonably balanced and looked at, discussed, you know, issues with law enforcement and, and structure with highway and sheriffs and DNR, other other people, other interests. So after we pretty much functioned as a uh, not so much a vote on issues individually, but as a general agreement with what we thought the issue was, and then a general agreement with what we should do about it. And, and I think we are pretty effective in our work to get where we are. Um, but anyway, we came to the conclusion that we need to do some amendments to Section 30 and 45. Uh, uh, we started out with a recommendation to limit campground size and type of camping unit in A2, in the forestry, and residential recreational three to a maximum of 25 sites Build by conditional use permit, and more importantly, restricted to mobile camping units and or rustic slash primitive sites. So does, does, that, does that mean that these big uh, RVs, uh, fifth wheel, whatever their park models, would not be in those? Right. Just okay. just the park models. Oh, okay. Anything oh, okay. Wheeler, anything that's towed with a typical vehicle could still go in these. It's just a park model where you need a semi to move it, basically. And and the, the point of this was because there is some movement uh, developing where people in, I think, A2 is a good example, where there's a harvest host, among others. Um, people join it membership and then they're provided access to these limited visit sites for wineries, breweries, vineyards, organic farms, orchards. Um, I would include into that like a, uh, event sites, uh, game farms, for example. Um, a good example of a game farm aspect was Boiling Creek in Apollo, which is unsold. So it didn't play, but they hosted the state sporting plays championship the first week in August. They no doubt, a friend, friend of mine who was there shooting, said there are a lot of nice, posh, uh, you know, motorhomes and, and some pickups towing campers. And lots of people were there in camp. Whether they had a special event license from the state, I do not know. I don't really care. <laughs> but that kind of an event, that's an, that would be in an A2 district. So there, there's a reasonable need for destination-based, go somewhere, stay for two days a week type camping. So we're trying to encourage that or, or at least provide it as an option. We talked about whether RR3 should or shouldn't be in this category because we qualified both forestry and A2. You know, forestry has to be consistent with the purpose of the forest. Obviously, a, a big campground in forestry, uh, other than the state forest campground type of thing, is probably not a good idea in a fire prone area. But uh, on the other side, uh, in A2, we're trying to say there's plenty of things where we could still see some camping, but it needs to be non permanent type of thing. Um, so this is this is recommendations and guidance. Obviously, we move this today. We'll be working on developing specific language and 
tweaking it a little bit. It seems to me we might, might want to look at some sort of a, a ratio to density of the district on these 25 unit campgrounds and provide on the CUP, the committee, some discretion on looking at that. So if you have five acres and you want a campground in RR3, probably not going to be a 25 unit campground. Maybe it's going to be a five unit campground, five to one ratio to development density maybe. Um, but if you're in Coyland Creek and you've got 300 acres in an area that's a game farm, 25 units wouldn't be very many. 25 is a hard cap. But so so maybe anyway. yes. Pardon? They're not zoned anyway. I'm, I'm hoping they come in. Oh, okay. But, or, but I'm using them as an example of a non agricultural, agricultural use. Okay? Yep. And in A2, we talk about related uses, you know, there's other things. We, we provided some event centers. Seems like an event center could potentially have a small camping provision for a wedding, anniversary, whatever group showed up and wanted to provide that. I think we're trying to not make it that you can't have a campground anywhere but in the proposed, uh, get to in a minute, mixed use district that would allow the whole complete gamut of camping from up tents to park models, right? Um, but I think I think there needs to be a little bit more development in in how we providing some CUP guidance to the committee on the number of up, up to 25. I'm wondering here to say how many acres. No, no, this we didn't we didn't uh, get into that really. That's the one thing I got from the comments of the, all the emails that we put in the record. Concern about suddenly a 25 unit campground popping up on a five acre RR3 lot. Well, I kind of get that. Uh, I'm not sure that that's economically viable that much anyway, but but I, I can see that we may be we're providing a conditional use permit though. And we did say we could put, uh, we, we read, there were maybe some other amendments necessary to our campground section that talks about density and other elements. So this is guidance. This is not all entirely final ordinance language, just where we think we should go. Um, the, the second recommendation was to provide for rezoning the existing campgrounds. Oh, wait a minute, I jumped ahead. I accidentally turned it on, sorry. Our second recommendation was to provide a residential recreational recreational commercial district as a mixed use district, which in which campgrounds are general camping allowed by conditional use permit. All types of camping units as defined in ATCC 79 could be permitted in that district. That's the way we've been doing it now. That's what most of our large campgrounds have already become. It, had we had this particular district, it would have applied perfectly to like the Holdens and Rosenthal's expansion, subdivision, separation type of use. We could condo that we couldn't do it as great commercial use because we don't district because we don't provide for residential non commercial associated residential activity. So the mixed use district that we discussed here would allow there to be some residential recreational use, but also recognize that a high intensity, high density park model seasonal campground is a more commercial than residential use in reality. So, but we're not allowing park models for campground. In in this district, yes, but not in the not in the three mobile camping unit only districts. No, park models would still be permitted in in the RCR R district because we have, we provided for any any camping unit that ATCP recognizes can go there. Not in the ones where there are 25 units or fewer. Correct. If it's in the 25 units or fewer, those could not have a park model. So your A2, F1, and RR3. 
could not have a party fund. The rationale we wrote on that was campgrounds have largely become high density mixed use recreational facilities with long term seasonal occupancy predominating, along with associated recreational commercial uses. This district will provide a zoning district that will be compatible with those uses while still providing some residential recreational use as well. Additionally, the act of rezoning to this district will provide town governments with review authority as the zoning action will provide for determination of consistency and compatibility with the town and county comprehensive plan and provide applicants with a reasonable expectation of success by reducing the uncertainty associated with the single application process of a conditional use permit. Well, where we are right now is that everybody throws their chips to the center of the table, comes in here and seeks a campground or not, gets it or doesn't. We get sued if we say no, because they would say Act 67 says you can't say no. The town can object, but the statute on comprehensive plan says that the CUP does not need to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Creating this district and adopting this will kind of defame Act 67 because once the applicant has gone through the process, met with the town, demonstrated consistency with the comprehensive plan, and we saw we do seek a rezone and it would be approved and go to county board. It's a legislative act. Now, when you come in for your campground conditional use permit, there's an expectation you would get approved because. You have already dotted your eyes and crossed your T's coming. It's not the scenario we have now where anybody who wants to sell 80 acres can say, well, that'd be a great place to have a campground because it's 80 acres for sale there and no other real qualifier. What I should have said initially is that we're pretty generous on where we currently allow campgrounds and CUPs based on our 1972 vintage ordinance language. When campgrounds work, but they become. But this would this would uh, help fix that, and it may make it hard for a while for somebody to develop a large campground. Right now, there's an awful lot of sentiment out there in opposition. But I think once once we get past the confrontational situations we've been having in. CUPs for requests like that, um, it would it would make it would be a little bit friendlier environment to work in. Who has to request the zoning change then? Who has to request so the zoning? That would be the applicant property owner. The applicant who wants to put the campground in on behalf of the property owner. Um, bear in mind I'm talking about new ones. And we also recommended, as was talked about a little bit today, that those that have if we adopt this and develop this language, then we will have prohibited campgrounds in RR1 and RR2 and you know, limited them in all the other districts. So existing campgrounds might be you know, the, the non-conforming legal but non-conforming use. If the applicant of an existing large campground wanted to seek the rezoning, we could we're, we're recommending we probably would be okay with that subject to conformance, compliance with the campground regulations we already have. The ones that we've recently allowed to expand, we've already gone over most of that. Density wise, other issues for you know um, compliance, setbacks, other things we require to be corrected. Um, that that would be that element would be considered. It isn't that we would just say we just wave a magic wand and everybody now owns this. You'd have to go through the process, publication, public hearing, but it would we would be receptive to that being done. That's what I think we're trying to say. But the towns can say yes or no. The town can still say no. It's the reason. And, and if the town says no on an existing campground, it's a legal non-conforming use. It's not going to go away. How really ought not to be motivated to say no if it's already there and it helps keep it in compliance. Uh, but they would have that option in the non-shoreland area, yes. Well, 
why are we allowing park models in campgrounds? Mostly because the state data trading consumer protection code defines them as camping units. But does that mean we have to allow them in campgrounds? Because they're essentially I'm saying no on a conditional use permit for a new campground. But look where they are already now. They have right, they have. So and, and on a new campground that was in the RCRR district, I would say yes, we would allow them because we're not going to differ. It. We, we um, can back up and say, I think we could restrict them because we do restrict them in subplanes and other okay. things. But I, I don't know that there's a reason to in a high intensity, high density district. My point comes from, you know, the vast majority of complaints we got from the citizens was taxes. Mm -hmm. So what, when they buy a park model, they're essentially establishing a residence. Don't disagree at all. So rather than letting them go to a um, campground, if we don't allow them in a campground, that will force them to either buy land and pay taxes on it and move their park model there or build a house. And I don't think we want them to move their park model because it still remains exempt, even if it's a private parcel. It's still a camping unit, okay? Uh, the town of Oakland and the town of Bass Lake and Sawyer County and some other towns are, are passing ordinance to exact a fee on every camping unit in the town in lieu of taxes, so, you know, to try to recover some of that cost for infrastructure and enforcement and whatnot. Um, but one, we'll get to this in a second. You may remember. We also agreed we weren't going to, uh, we, we looked into and considered, could we adopt a TCP 79 and then enforce it ourselves? And we, we were involved with that when that came up a few years ago and we opted not to. And we remain along with Washburn County on an island that, of two counties surrounded by counties who do adopt and force oh, that's a special thing. Yeah, but they have to they have to take the entire yeah. 79 code. They can't just take campgrounds. Yeah. We only really wanted to take campgrounds, but we can't. The problem with it is that ATC the 79, I'm just going to refer to it as 79 for ease of stuttering. <laughs> um, provides not only that that uh, park model units are camping units, it then provides you can take the tongue off and the wheels off and put them underneath and skirt them. It provides that campers may be stored on the site, on the campground. If we start to say, well, we want them removed for four months a year, where are we going to put them? And then we're going to be having to create storage facilities for that, to be, which people don't like either. Be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. Or if we're going to say you can't be there for four months, who is going to enforce that when the state agency itself, contrary to the plain language of its own code, says that if you leave for a week, you can come back, your eight months starts over. Whether it's January or not, it doesn't matter. We, that, that's a bridge too far for us to try to take, I think, you know, and to enforce it in a meaningful way. We could maybe enforce it only on new ones, but then if it's an equal protection under the law, you have to, why aren't you enforcing it on everybody or nobody, right? So I'm kind of of the opinion that if uh, there are persons out there who want to take on the state on how they enforce that code, they should saddle up old Rosanati and sally forth and charge that window on their own dime. But I don't think it's the Met County's job to fight the state over how it interprets ATCP 79. But under that rule, does that cover uh, DRBOs to the inspection? inspection? Yeah. Because would. there's been some requests by some towns officials that they would like to see you know, that inspection happen because there's some place to get like hundreds of them. It's, it's entirely possible that there might be enough merit in us pursuing adopting it. But 
out of the recommendations of the work group, strictly limiting it to campgrounds, we couldn't see that we could gain enough to justify it. If you and if you take on that inspection role, that's for everything. Yes. That's bars, restaurants. So right, but I mean, mm -hmm. again, the uh, the question was raised that because of the sheer numbers, that would be a, a division that could be self-supported. We could take a charge of people. It, it would be a matter of getting us to that point. So we'd have to find them and get them and enforce them, you know. Right. And so I think but that would all be done with bars and restaurants. And you can't just pick and choose what you and want. That would all be through the health department. Right. Not through zoning, so you'd have to get probably another committee of jurisdiction and another department to, I guess, agree to that. But wouldn't you agree we're going to soon be to the point where VRBOs, if they aren't already a problem, will be? Well, we have, what, 250 of them right now, and who uh, a handful maybe have licenses, I would assume. We, want, we talked a little bit about kind of Hornswell and Washburn County into joining us. In this, and uh, and they, they weren't in the same boat. They're not really able to do it right now. Doesn't mean things might not change, but that's the way, again, within the context of this report in this school, we, yeah. we can't go that we don't. When I was on the Health and Community Services Committee, we actually entertained this. One of the staff uh, was kind of trying to move us that way. Um, and we looked at it and decided that it just wasn't uh, profitable. It wasn't because you essentially have to hire someone and you have to be able to pay them. So it wasn't you could get enough fees to warrant hiring someone. Right, and, and they have to be not only that, not just someone. They have to be credentialed sanitarians, you know, to do this. Um, Back in the day, you know, when I, I used to do joint inspections with the sanitarian, we had in Washburn County, who then later got assigned Burnett County, known for years. Um, we'd look at septics, so they would learn about the septics, and I would look at campgrounds and restaurants and learn about them, kind of. You know, but we worked a lot better with the state back in the day than we have recently. Well, and that was, I think, has to do with the state cutting positions. You know, I mean, now, now you're getting, you know, they're covering way more counties than they can even effectively inspect. That's really true. Plus, switching agencies. That was with hell. You know, it's with egg. You know, so, but, but yeah, the point is, uh, they cut positions and then tried to get us counties to pick it up under their oversight. But the point is, is if it's under state oversight, you aren't going to get to say, no, we don't interpret it that way. You have to interpret it the way the state tells you. To interpret it just like the plumbing code, right? Not exactly like we can unilaterally say, well, we're going to do 79 differently than you do, Steve. I, I don't think I mean, it would be a real interesting court case again when the applicant says the state doesn't do it that way, how come the county is, right? So, Question I have, Craig. Um, you, know, you said for a new campground, it had to be rezoned to do that. How about? Existing campgrounds that want to expand. You would have to, if, if, if uh, yeah, there, we looked at this and talked about it and tried to identify where our campgrounds were and how many might be affected. And just, just for example, the forest, right. you know, they would have had to been rezoned to this new classification in order to expand. Yes, they would. Which they would, would. would meant that the town would have had to approve that. Yes, true. And at the current climate in that town, I don't think they would get it. But they're going to remain as they are then, legal non-conforming. On the other hand, in a few years from now, when things have calmed down, and they chose to do some that we have rezoned to that district, so they could add some amenities or something, you know, yeah. that might make perfect sense, right? Question but it would... isn't just for campgrounds. It's RCRR district is for associated recreational commercial uses and a few things like convenience or a few things like that would be permitted. Mostly we're sticking with conditional use permits. A little bit of a tangent. Uh, some people think we should just go to strictly a permitted use in a district and nail it right down. Uh, we give up all of our flexibility and the ability to consider other things that can come up in the discussion if we do it that way. 
So I think uh, having a condition use permit procedure within a district where it's expected it meets specs it should be approved is still allows us some discretion, which we would be absent in a let Jason write the permit and figure it all out scenario. Can we charge fees or does that have to be a um, Do what? No. Charge fees. Um, um, I don't think we have the authority to to uh, the tax like a or a charge a fee to a um, on an RV. Well, but, or you could uh, charge the camp camp ground per unit or something. Yeah, you know, on an annual basis that yeah. cover costs. That, that's what the towns are doing. I think that has to be through a town, though. The county doesn't have the. I don't think we can do that. I think we look for a stick. Yeah. The towns are doing it? The, the Oakland Township is, is investigating, yeah. investigating yeah. how, how to do it. And and I don't think anyone's doing it for example. That's like in Sawyer County also initiated something similar. How would a zones work if it was in a when split in the township like Oakland and Neenan. Would both towns have to approve it then? Yeah. For the portion yeah. for the portion in their town. It's like exactly right. It would be the same as any other rezone really. And and what we're doing is we're not re, we're not rezoning anybody to this district by creating it. We would simply be creating it to provide the district to rezone to in response to restricting and eliminating the activity that we're talking about in some zoning districts. So when, when we, if, if we do this, if we create a, amend, amendments to the ordinance and adopt these recommendations, we'll have limited campgrounds to a total of four districts, but they would be limited significantly in three of those districts. And it'd be as things are today in one district, which is the new floating district. That that would so we wouldn't we're not banning campgrounds, but we're tightening up on where they can be and what the process is to get a big high density campground. And still trying to recognize the need for some lower level destination based recreational mobile camping unit type common goal uses that could still be there without being in this district. Part of that is because we'd want to not be spot zoning 10 acres of a commercial district in an ag area, you know, just to accommodate somebody's wish for a campground of some sort. But on the other hand, we would be creating more uh, voices out there to say whether it should or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the the town is going to have to be the one that that fuels it gets the run of the. The town is going to be more involved, but frankly, the towns have been pretty darn involved with what we've been dealing with. And secondly, we adopted the you know the funny for 1030 comprehensive plan that fought solicitation of the town's plan is our plan, right? Well, it's just as reflective of the way things are kind of now. Let's put more authority in the hands of the town with the rezoning. But on the positive side, as I said, it sort of takes Act 67 out of the picture as being the sole controlling agent as to whether we approve or don't the conditional use. That, that is what my my view of what this committee has been through dealing with these things is a, a positive. I don't know if I mentioned it before, Oakland Town, how Oakland is going to have a referendum this spring on whether the people want more campgrounds. I told the supervisor, I said, well, I can tell you the answer right now. No. <laughs> they wouldn't have to do that, actually. No, this, 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 this would put them into the situation of having a more assertive authority. We still would have final say in the Shoreland area, but the odds of it being a very significant campground in a, entirely in the Shoreland area is pretty low, I think. There's not, where would it go? You know, But the existing, the existing big campground, some of which we have not expanded, you know, over on Yellow Lake and other places, may see, see, become 
employment. That would be potentially an interest in sale or other other act, things they may want to add, but uh, I don't know that it would be real common. Oakland has, what, seven campgrounds right now? Maybe it's okay for them to say they don't want anything. I'm saying that even in the Charlotte, can they approve or disapprove the zoning? I don't know, but they still have advisory rules mm -hmm. and the comprehensive plan is still in place. Well, the ones that we have, none of them would be, uh, would have to have a new, new zoning in order to have a campground. No, I would, I would say, uh, uh, one that we denied up in Switzerland, I thought in Shoreland. That was in Shoreland, wasn't it? No, Johnson's wasn't. Our guns wouldn't have been. No. But one out by the lake would have been. That would have been. Then the expansion, and you kind of view the expansions of the existing ones a little differently than the new ones, because it, it, we, that probably could be done anyway. But this would say if you're going to do that, we're going to acquire a uh, big tract of land with a bar and restaurant and condominium or existing resort cabins and lodge and, and campground, and you're going to break it off into a separate ownership entity. It would be better served by the RCRR district than as a condition of use. It would be more clearly permitted, less disputable. Yes. The zoning changes, Jason. You ever hear? Denials from, you know, I know we did from Lincoln, but any other towns either say yes or no to them? Or? Yeah, the rezones, we get more responses on a rezone from a town than we do on a conditional use permit, usually. We had a denial in Lincoln. Yeah. And we've had, you know, we've had denials off and on over the years, and, and maybe some of we should have and didn't, you know. Okay. But in this case, the township would initiate the zoning change. You okay. would um, have to go to the town to get permission for zoning change. Well, you would be, you could start at the county. Because oh. the county would well, usually what I tell people when they're trying to get a rezone is I say go talk to your town first because, you know, that typically doesn't cost you anything to get on their agenda and find out if they'll, you know, support, be in favor of it or not. And then once they get that answer, then I tell them to come formally through the county process. Just open the discussion on or yeah. ask questions, I guess. Go ahead. I know I've talked to Craig a number of times, but um, the zoning district sounds like a very good idea, but the fact that there's nothing out there of that quality right now means that everything you do has to go through the town for a rezone. That includes expansions or changes on anything. And that really makes things difficult for the owner on all of these things because it's basically like you said, it's probably going to be a no because nobody wants a campground, particularly new ones, and expansions to the existing ones might be just as difficult to get. And so the fact that there's no zoning district out there in that class right now and saying you, that's the only place you can put campgrounds is you're basically saying, no, we can't put campgrounds anywhere unless you have a, you know, have a lot of people in favor of you putting one out there. And that doesn't happen very often, probably. And then the other question on, the, on putting in the other districts, um, it's great to have the 25 acre, 25 campground minimum, but that's like telling a farmer you can have 10 cows. Like you're not going to have new commercial campgrounds come in that can operate with 25 campsites. It might work fine as a hobby or as a side job or something like that, but it's not going to be, a, and maybe that's not what you want either. And I understand that, but you can kind of, if you count these numbers, it's not going to happen. And so I don't think you'll have many applications for your campground, to be honest with you, in the future until things like Craig said settle out or if something else changes. And I don't, basically what you're saying is you're not going to allow them to you know here unless you go to the township and get rezoned. And then the question is how big of a plan do you have to have to get that approved? And we're finding out with when the Spooner and Washburn County, when it, when it goes to the fields and stuff process, we're three quarters of the way through getting the campground built before we can get approval. And that gets to be very, very cost expensive. So it's not gonna to happen to get turned down at the 11th hour to go through this process. So you're basically telling 
anybody from outside that wants to come in and make a campground or develop a campground in this area, it's not going to happen. That's that's my take of it. But you know, you might be different, you might think differently, or it might be rose colored and say that it will happen until it could happen. But I don't see that happening just based on the on the climate of townships right now. And on, on, on Pearson's comments, I really think I've been working with the town of Oakland. I've been staying on every one of their committee meetings too, and know where they're coming from on these things, but. And I've talked to three or four people in Marshburn County and on the VRBOs and so forth. We're doing our fifth or sixth VRBO neighbor problem survey right now. And if you don't think they're a problem, I know Jason can probably answer this too. They are. And so I think you better look at getting your inspections and your you know, review of those coming forward too, because that's the next thing that's going to come to because I see it happening personally because. We get contact with neighbor issues all the time on these now. And it's becoming the issue once the neighbors that have to pay for it, not the, not the RBO too right now, basically. And so I see that as an issue also. Mark, just one, one minor question. I, I, I know we've talked about this a little too, but um, I think the one thing about the rezoning process, and admittedly it'll be a little while before the animosity wears off of the whole process recently, I think. But you wouldn't have to produce as detailed of a plan to seek a rezoning as you would to get the conditional use permit, I don't think. And I would kind of, because it's, it's not, that that's not the permit. That's just, this is where we want to put it. We have suitable soils. We have access. We have public road, you know, infrastructure to support it. That kind of thing is what you get out of the rezone. And then if you move, pretty likelihood of success once you've got that. You wouldn't be as reticent about, God, I got to do all this detail to get a conditional use permit to submit, right? It would, it would seem to me the two-step process would, would at least give you a lot more confidence that you're not going to spin your wheels and go through all this and still get sent away, right? So you have to remember on every one of these um, applications that have with the CUPs, First thing the opposition does is hire an attorney. Yeah. And well, we don't come in with the, I haven't come in with the attorney first on any of our applications yet because we think we understand the rules and hopefully work with the county and the committee on the rules. It's when the attorneys get involved that ask the other questions that force the issues to go to the environmental impact statements and all these other issues that are kind of superfluous to what the real question is. We don't want you here or we, we accept you here type of thing. That's the zoning question is a tough one. It's not a popularity contest either. So. Well, I, I still think, I, I would still say that an awful lot of this got spun out of Act 67 because people were grabbing at everything to to uh, oppose when they were told that there wasn't any way they could oppose, right? Um, and so to, to a certain extent for the members of this committee who I think have been through a lot of these things at great uh, not stress, at least aggravation. Uh, we can level the playing field and say that, okay, Act 67, boys, we're going to defang it. And it's still going to apply on the conditional use permit in RCRR, but it's going to be a lot more defined, a lot more controlled. And so you're going to have to do some more sales on getting it to that point. To get somebody saying, I've got a good spot. I can demonstrate this is a good idea. I can get the town on board. Company has a plan to be met. Every thing, you should not have to have the fight that we have had right now. You know, right now, you know, admit, admittedly, all you have to do to <laughs> have a campground is find some guy with 80 acres for sale. Because you can put an offer to purchase and contingent on me getting a campground permit. No further study was required to apply, right? And it, it's, it's become too big of a deal to just let it be like that anymore, in my opinion. The only other question we had, too, was a comment, too, and I think it sounds like it got raised in emails, is um, you have to have something very density. Um, big is not always dense, but you're looking more at numbers yeah. The way you guys were looking at it seemed to be more like numbers, total numbers, rather than density. And I see a lot of dense developments on small pieces and new ones, particularly 
what was interesting in Washington County is the two or three prior ones to the one large one that we're working on right now were denser than our units were by far. But they were approved without even thinking about a density issue, whereas um, the sheer numbers is what scares people rather than, you know, if the 300 acre piece and you only have 180 units on it, it is not dense. Right, I agree. I think I think we're going to talk about question. on some of those accessory and you know adjunct and accessory to like little campgrounds. I think we want to look at some some uh, density on them as well. The idea the idea is there is exactly what you said. They're not necessarily meant to be an exclusive money maker for the campground, but an opportunity for people that have other permitted or conditionally approved uses. That might want to host some campers from time to time <coughs> and be able to do that without having to be in this district. That was the rationale behind that. And I think we will work on some density issue management on that as well, is to come up with a so that it isn't just arbitrary and capricious on the part of the CUP process to say, no, you can't have that many, you know, or or yes, you can. You've got enough land to support that lower density. So we're fine with it, right? I think we do need to do that. So what do you need then? You're going to continue this and codify it or put it in a form that's well, going to go to a public hearing? Or? What I'm after today is, is to go to the next step to start to develop final ordinance language and take the public hearing. If everything is perfect, we might be able to do it next month. I don't know if we can get it done that fast. We'll try. We'll try. Yeah. And if we have it ready to take the public I mean, hearing. You have the public hearing, and then we can always make changes at the public we hearing. May, we may do like we did with the egg stuff and continue with another one. Or maybe we'll say, we love this, let's go. You know. Well, I'd, I'd move that you move it along and get it you know, sharpened up to a to a point of uh, approval. Except, except to report and move, move it to the next phase. Right. Developing. Mr. Pearson, too. I'll go on to the next step and bring it back and I guess that's October, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so we technically have for a public hearing in November or something. So I think what we would do is we're going to try to do a public hearing in October. Right. And um, then move it to the full board. And then move it to the full board in October because your, your moratorium expires in October. If everything goes perfectly, it would go in October. If it doesn't, and we have to fix the major repairs or something, then probably wouldn't be till November. How are we going to fix um, those suggested ideas, you know, the density and so on? I'll, Ian Craig will make oh, up something. Right. That's what I was looking for. Uh, ordinance. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just, just like we did with the eggs. Yep. Yep. Okay, motion. Is there a second? Second to Mr. Anderson. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Okay. Will the rezones be automatic, or you said that would be strictly up to the towns to rezone to that district then? To the On the rezone? On the rezones, is it? I mean, when we talked before, you thought it was pretty much going to be an automatic, but now well, it sounds like it's, it's totally up to the towns. Uh, I think it's going to have to be requested. You know, um, I could I could justify. If uh, the existing places, you know, that we've expanded recently, requested, uh, that we might say, yeah, we just paid for a conditional use permit, we'll, we'll, we'll process this and do the public hearing and not charge you for it, maybe, but it's still going to apply. You know, we're not going to unilaterally zone somebody who didn't ask to be resolved. I understand that, but the, I'm asking about the denial of it or the opportunity for it denied on it, if that's something that's being requested by the committee or the county because that's their um, recommendation. As Lauren said, though, the, the ones that we're talking about are primarily shoreland areas. That would be ones that would be eligible for mixed shoreland and non-shoreland. Um, I, I, my, my talk with people were that they're more upset about the new ones than the expanded existing ones, really. And, uh, so if we're just cleaning up, I think we can justify it, you know. And I can't say if the town decides it's going to sharpen its axe and make a recommendation of denial when it's still in the existing legal non-conforming use. It doesn't do anything 
averse to them, really. Except for if they want to do something going forward. Yeah. And then that they may have to wait a while. Moving on to number eight, land services. So the reports are in there. Uh, you have what the staff has been working on for the last few months. Budget report is in there. Obviously, we've already far exceeded our revenue um, for the month. Um, so that, uh, and there's nothing else glaring or any other issues in the budget there. Website statistics are in there, about 300 users on the weekdays, 100 or so on the weekends. But the country's in there this time. And then the permit zoning report is in there. Permits year to date, 85 new dwellings so far. How does that compare to the same time a year ago? You know, you guys ask me every month, and I never know because uh, I never look. Um, <laughs> um, I can check that out. Look at last last year's report. Yeah, look on last year's report. But uh, I, I, if I recall correctly, I think for the whole year last year, I think we only had 90 wow. some dwellings, maybe or something. I can't remember what it was. It was up. Yeah, so it's up. Um, yeah, lots of conditional use permits, lots of variances this year too, which is ridiculously high. Um, and then got staff reports in there as well. So, our permits dipped just a little bit in July. So, I'm almost wondering if we're back to like a typical year because then they were coming back up now in August again. It should, be, so, it should be an October panic when everybody Yes. Yep. So, oh, I promised I'd get that done. But last year we didn't have a dip in the summer. It was just it's crazy all year. So I don't know if we're yeah, getting back to more normal where we're peak in the spring, lull in July, peak in the fall, lull mm -hmm. in the winter. Summer so was the price of Menard come up. Yeah, that didn't seem to stop a whole lot. I mean, this spring. People were still going like crazy, but yeah. And wood is coming down a little bit now, so maybe yeah. the permit pace will pick back up. I know, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. Right. I looked at the report from uh, a year ago. Permits issued through August 26, 2020, um, land use 535, of which 62 mm. are new dwellings. So we are definitely up. Yeah. Hey, other agenda items, future agenda items. So next month we'll shoot for having a public hearing for the campground amendments in chapter 30 and chapter 45. Um, and then I have a couple CUPs on my desk. Can't remember what they are, but I do know I have a few. So. Oh, good. I got a lot to talk about this time. <laughs> yes. Uh, do we want to do anything about this inspection stuff? Which I think would be in the Health and Community Services Committee that um, needs to be brought to their attention. There's some care to ask them if they'd be willing to reopen. Maybe we should ask them if they'd be willing to put it on their agenda and talk about it some more. Well, there, there are new factors now, like with the VRBOs and, and that kind of stuff. So I don't think it'd be anything that happened soon because it would require budgeting for staff and all that, but it would be something to talk about. I mean, well, and the, the trend is going that way, that yeah. the counties are taking that over. So, I mean, if it doesn't happen now, I'm I would assume eventually it will be mandated probably that the county do it, I would guess. Yeah. Um, now, you know, you raise a really good point. I and mean, it's a majority of the counties in the state doing it. It, you know, it, just, it makes us look like, why are you guys not? Well, I'm, before, I'm, I remember when uh, Jake wanted to hire an, an, an additional forestry person, he justified it. I say this is future revenue if we bring this person in that we would not be able to do that. So I would see that this we 
have to figure out what the or Health and Human Services would have to justify, um, figure out if we're going to bring in the revenue. Well, and I think Sawyer just did it a few years ago, and they've, I think, set their fees up so that it's like neutral cost, you know, so they're not yeah. losing money, but they're not making a windfall either. Um, you know, so they're trying to have it be cost neutral. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing about all the counties of Angus, and you look at them, you know, they, except for Hudson Washburn, really, Washburn had Spooner, but not a lot else for urban area. But Douglas County, Superior, Sawyer County, Hayward, the town of Hayward alone are the size of the city, plus so all of the tourism kind of stuff they have. I mean, the Polk is adjacent to the cities, a lot of riverfront development. Barron has Rice Lake, among others. You know, so there, when you have that pretty big city with quite a bit to do with the health department, I think it makes it easier to justify. I think that was probably the looking at the numbers of what was there because it didn't look good back in the day. It looks better now. Right now, it doesn't, uh, well, like restaurants and bars, it doesn't cost anything. They still come in once a year and inspect you. Yeah, that's what I wanted to hear. But uh, until a few years ago, maybe it was even 10 or 12, we used to do our own well, uh, test our own water. And it was a $12 fee to send it into the state. The Polk County Health Department has taken over the water inspection and now it cost me $45. And he does the same thing I did. He comes in, cleans the tap, puts a little bottle under it, seals it up. And I'm going to where he sends it. I'll be back to Probably the $12 that I used to spend. <laughs> and, and you just made $32 on it. You were motivated to do a careful test. You didn't want a bad report. That's right. Something to be said for that. <clears throat> so, I mean, yeah. there is a cost that if we would pick it up, there'd be a cost to it. Whether it be in the inspection uh, and the licensing fees for the VRBOs or the campgrounds or whatever, we'd have to have some kind of a, a, a fee to pay them. Mm -hmm. But then for the bar inspections too, which is zero to you right now, right? Yeah. So well, I, I, I pay my Wisconsin tax, so. There you go. So there's a benefit for the people. I mean, the people are asking for it, so it's good as well. We've got to consider it. Is anybody on that committee? In this committee, on help. Oh, Brent. Sure. There you go. There you go. Got an end. We have an end. Talk, talk yeah. to cybers. Yeah. Back when I was on the committee, he hours ago, talked about a thing, but get a public health person. And it seems like it's a recurring thing. Yeah. yeah. When I was on it, it came up too. Well, the other. Future agenda items. Okay. If not, we stand adjourned. Yeah. Oh, we got any, any mm -hmm. of no, no. course, we didn't have enough to do, and we don't have the thing back from Ed yet. On the do you have any cans for the scouts? Uh, do you have any cans for the scouts? Uh, they came and picked them up. Uh, I remember a time ago. Okay. okay. We haven't we haven't we're just bought all bottles. Okay. Oh we well, have a couple of cans and those people aren't big drinkers. Okay. All right. Chuck, did you ever get in the community center at Webster? That's generally home. There's a whole garbage can yeah. over there. Okay. Um, last night.